All right, welcome everyone. We're here again. We've got our guest, Sean Arendt. He has the biggest resume I've ever seen when it comes to sports science and sports nutrition. <laughs> uh, so we've got current president of the ICSN, yep. which is awesome. Then we've got head of human performance at Rutgers. Center for Health and Human Performance. Center yep. for Health and Human Performance. And then we've got you do some stuff with Compound Solutions. Yeah, well. we've got some research grants with them. We've got yeah. a research grant with uh, a research partnership with Quest Diagnostics, things like that that are all ongoing. It is ridiculously awesome. Yeah. Thank so, you. We're going to go through our introduction. So we've got Joey at Joey Cantlin PC. I'm at the Australian Sports Nutritionist. Kyle, the physique coach. Brandon Kempter, BK Conditioning. And then your handle is Sean Aaron. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Done. Yep. It's easy. Nice. All right, so let's kick in. Um, one of the things, I guess, that I really wanted to talk about with you specifically was um, more to do with your chat yesterday. Okay. Uh, like a brief synopsis, so yep. that way they don't get like the whole thing. But the difference between sports uh, and performance nutrition and body composition nutrition, I guess yep. some of the contra contradictions that you saw really with that side of things. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, it, it really started to strike me a number of years ago when um, it seemed like even in the research and then the sort of the, the questions that were being asked with the research as well as the application, um, we seem to be moving farther and farther away from performance aspects related to nutrition, and it really just came down to how do you look, right? So it's much more the physique side, and that's fine. But the problem is we started drawing conclusions about how to use this for athletes based on things that really you would not want to recommend to them. And so I, I just felt like we were kind of straying from what got us going as the ISSN, you know, with sport nutrition. And it really started to come down to when you work with athletes, and I'm very fortunate to work with some pretty high level athletes, you know, and so when you, you see some of these studies where they say they work with athletes and what they really mean is they really work with, with recreationally trained individuals and there's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're working with an athlete, <clears throat> there's very much this mentality of, you know, what's the most I can do, right? It's, it's rather than just, um, you know, minimal effective dose because that can mean so many things and effective for making progress, but does it maximize your outcomes? Um, you know, when we're working with athletes, we deal a lot with, you know, maximal tolerable dose. What's that point you can push to before there's breakdown, you know, because it's that extra little half of a percent that can make a difference in some of these events. Um, so when we started looking at the physique stuff, you know, it was really one of those things where, you know, a lot of it started to come from the whole, if it fits your macros and, you know, you, you you don't have to really pay attention to food quality. It's just all about calories. And you kind of go, for what? Because it was all about you can get lean doing this. Okay, but is it the healthiest? And actually, if you look at a lot of the research, especially in terms of processed versus whole food and things like that, there's some really interesting data on the role within the health outcomes, especially related to inflammatory responses, liver enzymes, and things like that. So and that study that just got released. The, the Kevin know, Hall study, yeah, yeah with yeah. you know, and you find that eating ultra processed food led them to eat more, right? Because yeah, they weren't fifty calories, <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is no small amount. Yeah. Um. So I think you know that started to to make me think about you know what where are the contradictions here, um, and we even see it in terms of the training approach, right? It's like oh, you don't have to lift heavy in this net. Now, not lifting heavy maybe not isn't quite as good, but it still works. And and so it you know from a general population standpoint, that's fine if you're just looking to make some recommendations for what what will work. Maybe not what works best though. And I think that for me on the sport nutrition side of things, I feel like it always should be about optimization. How do we get the most out of what we're doing? And I feel like what started to happen on the physique side was, um, you know, w w do we have to do that? You know, what's, what's the yeah. least we can get away with, you know? And, and that's yeah. fine. And, and I feel like that was a little bit more the research approach rather than it was, you know, sort of, you know, it, I feel like in some cases we take this huge myth busting um, approach to these things and that's fine, but what's the practical recommendation that comes out of that? Yeah, you know? exactly. And it's sort of like that whole, um, you know, you know, like I said yesterday, when did it become a good thing to do the least you possibly can to succeed? Yeah. You know, and it's sort of like, you know, hey, average is good, you know? and. So I just wasn't a big fan of that, especially when we work with athletes. And I think the turning point for me was when I started to see strength coaches, especially with the, the protein timing meta that Brad Schoenfeld and them came out with. And, you know, no problem with the meta per se, but, you know, just call it for what it is because most of the studies in there are in non-trained individuals. They're, they weren't, these aren't athletes. Um, but we started to make conclusions about what nutrient, or really more importantly, protein timing, because it wasn't a nutrient timing study. Um, there's a whole lot of other nutrients. Yeah. Um, but what does protein timing mean for athletes? And you know, look, 
I think probably the most important conclusion out of that whole thing was, at the end of the day, total protein intake in a day is the most important thing. You can time the crap out of it if you don't eat enough protein. <laughs> it's not going to be as good, right? But then timing layered on that starts to become, again, back to that optimization issue. Yeah. You know, and I think even Paul Arciero has some really good work on protein pacing in terms of the timing of intake that goes along with that. Um, but you start to see that approach and then, you know, I see strength coaches going, oh, I knew you didn't have to eat protein right away after your workout. So I tell my athletes, don't eat after a workout. That, I'm not sure where the leap in logic came from there. And I think that's when you start to realize that, you know, some of these things we're talking about were just related to just hypertrophy, not performance, um, started to become an issue, you know? And, and I think that's the thing we have to pay attention to is gaining muscle is not the same thing as performance. Yeah. Mm. Losing body fat is not the same thing as performance. These are important parts of it, sure. But at the end of the day, you know, how fast can you finish starts to become yeah. another issue. And you um, also alluded to yesterday, which is a really good, and I, you know, like a, a really big point when you're looking at long-term outcomes was yeah. the compounding effect of those 5% increases when, right. you know, executed really well because yeah. we're looking at acute versus chronic and acute controls and studies that don't necessarily have athletes. And yeah. if you've got 5% over three years and 36 months, that's a huge improvement. You know? Yeah, especially for an athlete. And when you start to look at, you know, some of the, I mean, look, there's not a lot of really long-term studies. You know, even the work that we're doing in female athletes in particular, I mean, we're fairly fortunate to be able to track them for an entire season. You know, where we've got them for four or five months of high intensity, high volume type of work. And some of the changes we're seeing in them physiologically are pretty damn notable. Um, but again, if you got you know an eight or 10 week training study and you're gonna try to reach conclusions about what that's gonna mean over the course of a year, you know, and even with the stuff with the low load versus high load training, right? In terms of some of the work that Stu Phillips and his group have, have done, you know, the, one of the questions you have to ask yourself is if you take a trained individual and you put them on a high volume, uh, you know, basically a high rep training program, is it in some ways, same thing as periodization where you've now changed up what they do so they respond to that, right? This is a new stimulus. What's going to happen in 12 months? Can you sustain that on that? And I think that's why it's important to realize that we can train. And, you know, it's funny kind of what, what's old is new again. Um, yeah. But really what it comes down to is train through a variety of rep ranges. Yeah. That's, you know, kind of what it really it's alludes to. Yeah. yeah. And it in many ways points back to the periodization issue when it comes to hypertrophy, long-term progress and things like that. So, you know, and I think... From a mechanistic standpoint, I think those studies are important. They're, they're very important. I just think that, you know, we have to be a little bit logical in the conclusions we're drawing from that and the recommendations we make. Because if, if it's something that takes you three times as long to do is about as good as something that doesn't, which one are you going to recommend? You know, and I mean, to be honest, to be fair, we've seen the same thing even with like blood flow restriction training. Yeah. I think a lot of the, the leaps in logic we've taken with that is it's never been found to be as good as weight training, no. yeah. but it's a nice adjunct. In other words, you can yeah. add it in for certain things, especially if you're rehabbing an injury. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, call it what it is. There's nothing wrong with that. We don't have to sort of be all encompassing and what we're trying to conclude out of this. And, and again, that notion of optimization versus it's good enough. Um, you know, those are areas that we kind of have to contend with. Yeah, and I think one of the things that you were talking about yesterday, which was really good, was um, the uh, you know the fact that the exercise interventions are king, and yeah. and, and I guess as an adjunct to that, um, uh, one of the things that I found really interesting when we were talking later that evening was that um, you know like you were correcting a lot of like you say, hey, train heavy, that's the best thing. You know, well, I mean, relatively, right? He doesn't mean yeah. you have to do like, you know, two, three, four RMs all the time, but you know, eight, 10, 12, I wouldn't consider that light training yeah. Yeah. per se. So, you know. So like you're recommending, you're recommending those loads, but you were correcting a lot of movement dysfunction. Yeah. In Australia, we've got this sort of thing where it's like, you know, like what Eric was talking about, it's like IFYM with their banner and then we've got sort of like technique and then lift as heavy as if your life depended on yeah, it. And right. Stuff. And so people think hear heavy and think, oh yeah, I've got to be doing that side of things right. where again, that's sort of not what you're saying at all. And one of the first thing that you, like one of the, I guess, first interventions that you had was a good S&C program, but the frequent assessments with the yes. athletes and then identifying what those risks were and addressing them as well. Yeah, assessment is critical. And I think the other thing too is, you know, it's kind of like velocity-based training, right? There's yeah. absolutely value to measuring velocity. But here's the thing, if you have an athlete who can't squat appropriately, why are you gonna have them move the weight fast? 
Yeah. Like you, you need to fix yeah. the yeah. form first, and then you can progress to more velocity manipulation. But if they can't even hip hinge, and they can't, you know, and keep proper um, scapular placement and things like that, they don't have, you know, it's one of those things where why are you going to move fast when you can't even move it right? through a normal speed, yeah, yeah. you know, but once you get that down, now you can start manipulating some other velocity variables and things like that. And, you know, I see strength coaches that'll have athletes, you know, we're doing plyometrics and box jumps and all these other things, and there's massive knee valgus, and they don't correct it. And you're going, so all you're doing now is you're just overloading poor technique. So fix the technique, identify, and the thing is too is, the exercise itself, right, rather than having to deal with like functional movement screens and all these other things, you can, if you pay attention to the exercise performance itself, there are a lot of deficiencies you can pick up on to identify where the weak point is, use regressions in the exercise to break it down to address where maybe they have a limited range of motion, where they may have glute medius, you know, weakness and things like that. So, I think when you start to look at it from that standpoint, you know, using the, the workout itself and the assessment, the testing, you can identify where some of these things are that you can address to to improve function, to improve strength, to improve performance, to improve uh, uh, injury risk. You know, we're never going to prevent injury, right? But if we can do anything to reduce the risk of it, mm-hmm. we're doing a pretty good job. You know, and if we can keep them healthy and keep them on the field, then we're doing great. And even in the weight room with power lifters and things like that, like, you know, before you get to that point where that back is rounding on that deadlift and, you know, you're blowing out discs and stuff like that, like, let's pay attention to how you get there in the first place. Mm. Quality of movement. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. And that was like a really big stat you had from yesterday was you had something like 10 season ending injuries before, right right before you started. It was unbelievable, yeah. And then you've come in, you've had five seasons, and then had one season in, in the injury, and that wasn't even to do with the match play or anything like no, that. No, and, and it was pretty amazing. And, you know, and I think for us, that was, you know, what, ha, one of the most important things when you're working with athletes and teams and stuff like that is buy in, right? Like from top down, mm-hmm. the coach, the players, everybody. And one of the fastest ways they see that is when um, they're not getting hurt. You know, do we have soft tissue stuff? Sure. Are we going to have, you know, nicks and dinks? It's a contact sport when we're playing soccer, right? I mean, there's there's inherent risk yeah. to this. But if you can prevent these major things, um, you know, you know, you can't control a player comes in, slide tackles, takes out somebody's ankle or whatever. Like, you're, no matter what. But here's the thing. If my player's faster because of the way we've been training them, do they get out of the way too? Can I make a 50-50 ball a 60-40 ball? Yeah. And now they're not yeah. getting hit when they're going in, right? Yeah. It's those little things. But I think that... Um, you know, when we're looking at what's happened with season-ending injuries, it's not, <laughs> I would love to say it's it's like we've got some awesome technique that nobody else understands and it's our big secret. <laughs> At the end of the day, you know what we do? We lift, we try to give them enough recovery, we monitor load, and we routinely assess. And that's it. It's not magic. You know, it's one of those things where just pick a few things and do it really well. I see so many of these teams and that, that think they're doing sports science, but really what they're doing is they're just dabbling in technology. They're not really using it. And you know, my thing is, you know, pick three or four big movers that are gonna have the biggest impact on performance and just get really good at those. Don't worry about all the other little measurement tools. Not that those might not have a place, but get good at what you need to do basically first. You know, before we ever moved into GPS, we were doing heart rate. Before we ever moved into, you know, manipulating carbohydrate intake, we were trying to get nutrition basics down. You know, it's like you yeah. can't go right yeah, to, yeah. to that top end when they don't even have the, it, you know, it's the same thing as with, with any exercise movement, right? You're not going to go right to the most advanced and heaviest thing you can possibly do when they don't know how to do it right in the first place. Yeah. So, so I think from that standpoint, those are the things we try to do. We lift through the season. You know, we've, we've really managed to maintain. Actually, last year they got stronger through the season just because of the way we were able to do this. And, um, you know, and here's a team that played, you know, 11 overtime games mm-hmm. in yeah. a college soccer season. It's an NCAA record and, and, and yeah. didn't lose a single one. Yeah. You know, and so if you can do that, uh, now that being said, uh, we should have won more in regulation. That would help. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but, but again, you know, and I will say this, I think, um, you know, I, I've had this a lot. I'll get, you know, emails, twi- uh, you know, tweets, you know, where like, you know, how do I become a sports scientist? How do I, how do I, you know, how do I become a good sports scientist? Whatever. I, lo- there's actually one secret. 
work with good athletes, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> because they make you look really good, you know. You're only as good as your athletes. That's exactly. I mean, it's one of those. One of my favorites. Say, one of the coaches we work with, uh, I just love it. But he's like, you know, you can't make chicken sa- chicken salad out of chicken shit, you know. So it's one of those things that you need you need the quality there in the first place. We're yeah. very lucky to work with some great athletes. And what we do though is, you know, maybe compared to some other teams, maybe we don't have as highly uh, touted recruits and things like that. So what we just have to do is we just have less margin for error. Mm-hmm. They're still, we still have phenomenal athletes. We just have to maximize their potential as best as possible. And now we are competitive with anybody on any stage. You know, and I think that that to to the team's credit and, and what they've been willing to do um, to buy into that and do it the right way, um, you know, I think that's important. I think those are important lessons too when you're working with clients yeah. on, on the physique side of things or, you know, body fat loss and whether you're working with a team is, you can give them the best program in your mind, right? Like, like if you really want to succeed at this, you need to do this and this and this and this. But the, the, the thing that I always tell, you know, like my students especially is never walk in and tell a team or a client what you can do for them. Walk in and go, what do you need? Mm-hmm. What, what do you need? And what's the skill set that you need, you know, adapted? And here's how we can then provide that versus here's what I think you need right off the bat. You don't know because you got to find out where where the trouble is, right? Like, what do you need to? What needs to be fixed and what's already good? You know, how do you build on the strengths? Yeah. And I think you have to have an understanding of what they're willing to do, right? I mean, you could walk in and be like, you know, it's always funny if you have a client that comes in. I've I've been on the personal training side of things, right? And they'll come in like, you know, I'm gonna I need a you know five day a week program and I want to do this. And my first question is, okay, so five days a week. So how many days will you actually work out? <laughs> well, I mean, I know I can do three. But I think I can do five. Okay, tell you what, what we might do for five days is very different than what you would do for three. So we need to know what you will do. Yeah. Then we can build that program and start to, you know, so you have to be, you know, have this understanding of what they're willing to do for real, right? And then that way you can maximize the efficacy of that program within that time period. And then as they get better, that now maybe they do start to progress to being able to do five days because they're willing to buy into it. Same thing with the team. You have to understand what can you gain from the team in terms of recovery days? What will they give you in terms of off days to, to know when you can push them, when you have to back off? Um, what's our travel schedule like? What realistically can you take on the road with you? You know, things like that. So so having an understanding of, of what what they need from you, I think, is, is a critical aspect um, to being successful regardless of the population you're working with. So um, your background... Yeah, well, your PhD is in endocrinology, yep. right? And this is a big thing and it's quite trendy within the country um, where people are just putting so much emphasis on hormones yeah. for performance outcomes and body composition outcomes. I know that, you know, people like yourself, Stu Phillips has done some good research mm-hmm. in this area as well. Yes, yeah, Stu like, has. Um, you know, like I'm constantly saying, like, you know, endogenous versus super physiological and exogenous yeah. are two completely different schools of thought. And we sort of, it's sort of like the, the white potato analogy is sort of what I liken it to, you know? Like people think that because sweet potato isn't white and it's a different potato that it's better for them. Right. And so they think that, you know, because these results are occurring with super physiological exogenous yeah. hormones that and we're gonna manipulate the endogenous levels and have these great outcomes. Right. You know, like, what are you seeing? How would you sum it up for people? I mean, so in my mind, hormones matter the most, right? Because yeah. ultimately, if you look at the endocrine system, it drives a lot of adaptations. But that being said, when we start getting caught up in these these small changes in some of these responses, you know, the, the, you know, what's the ultimate big driver there? And, and we see, you know, good adaptation to the endocrine system with training, and you know, and and what it gets really good at doing is responding slightly less. In other words, it's not as big of a of a hiccup to it. It's not of a as much of a stress, yeah. right? So it handles it better. And then in other cases, when you look at like catecholamines and cortisol, we can go even more super physiological in terms of that that temporary response to mobilize resources, right? And and I think cortisol for me is sort of, um, I think one of the best sort of like a microcosm of what's gone awry 
with the media and interpretation of hormones, right? And all of a sudden, cortisol became the bad guy, right? Everybody's fat because of cortisol. And cortisol's so bad. And here's a cortisol blocker and blah, blah, you know. Oh, adrenal fatigue, which is not a thing, um, drives, <laughs> drives me nuts. It, it, seriously, if, you hear, if you're ever working with somebody if, and somebody's looking for a trainer, a nutritionist, whatever, and they, and they even use the word adrenal fatigue in a non-mocking way, where in other words, they're like, it's probably adrenal fatigue, <laughs> like find somebody else, seriously, because they don't know what they're talking about. You know, I heard this at a couple presentations, even at NSCA and stuff like that. You got some people that, that are like self-taught endocrinologists that seem to think they have a handle on this. <laughs> and it's a frightening thing, you know. So I, I think that we have to be very careful how we interpret the hormones. But at the end of the day, like if you block cortisol, right? So if I give you a dexamethasone bolus and I go have you exercise and I block cortisol with that, your performance goes down the toilet. Yeah. You're done, yeah. right? It, it, yeah. you, you're not mobilizing resources. But chronically, if cortisol stays elevated, that's not a good thing because now you're in a state of disrepair. It's a catabolic state. So what you want cortisol to do with exercise is up and down and up and down and up and down. And the thing is sleep helps in the recovery of that. So now if I'm not getting enough sleep, cortisol kind of starts to stay up here. If I have an overtrained athlete, cortisol has been hanging out here. It's not because your adrenal gland is exhausted. Yeah. It's it's literally because of the feedback mechanism and receptor changes and then yeah. this constant state of engagement that you need to be able to back off from. So then some of that comes from eating enough. You know, we know that, that carbohydrate can help with, with cortisol and epinephrine recovery and things. So so I think we have to be realistic in the interpretation. But yeah. You go, you, you lift weights and you get a you know an acute testosterone response. Is that gonna dictate how big you get? Not necessarily, but you know, with some of the work going on with androgen receptors, the, the ability to take up that yeah. testosterone is also important. Um, but look, at the end of the day, if I'm working with an athlete, and I think this is the other thing we have to be careful of, um, there is a flip side to this, and I see this with physicians in terms of the way they interpret things. It's in normal range, okay? Let me give you an example where that might not apply. We have athletes that stay within normal range, but they go from high normal to low normal, and they've had 150% change in their hormone response. Is that normal? No, to me, no, that's no, not no, good. No. You know, and it's funny because somehow there's this magic line. We see this with with some things we've dealt with with iron, uh, with some of our athletes, where all of a sudden it's like, you know, they're they're two points above the bottom of normal. Well, they're still within normal range. They drop three points, and all of a sudden they're below normal. It's like, oh, now we need to do something. Well, the, the bigger drop was the 75% that they came down in the first place, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? So I think that, that we have to be in tune. Um, and, and I think in some ways, if you're going to rely on interpreting hormones to do this, you also have to assess them frequently enough that you're going to be able to track these changes over time. Just once a year is not going to tell you that. And I think that's an important consideration as well to, to figure out how all these things sort of fit together. But yeah, do I think hormones important? Of course. Do I think the whole reason we're fat is because of insulin? No, I think that's been debunked. But that being said, insulin responses have other health value or health outcomes. So I think as we tie that in with the nature of meal structure and things like that, those are all important parts of it. I'm just pulling something out that I did um, regarding this a while ago. I'll just okay. get your thoughts on it. Uh -huh. I think a lot of people try to, like they'll see, or they may send clients away for testing, and they'll come back and they'll notice their hormones are within range from, yep. their, from their GP, and they go, oh, there's nothing wrong. Right. Um, and they don't actually realize that you can optimize that yeah. range, you and can, you, you, you can, you can take someone further up and high, on the higher end yep. of the range, but because they're getting told, oh, no, it's all right, everything's all sweet, this number isn't in bold, yeah. so, so yeah, it's not yeah, highlighted, yeah. they go, oh, I don't know what's wrong with me. Well, actually, you're at the lower end of the spectrum, and you know, just a slight change could bring you completely out of it where you're acquiring HRT or yeah. something like that, where you could actually optimize that to begin with. Yeah, absolutely, and I think the other way of looking at that too is, um, you know, realize anytime we do, we do a blood panel, it's a snapshot in time. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, it's funny. I've had people that will do, you know, the biomarker panels that we use with our athletes, whatever, and it comes back normal, right? Like it looks good. And they're like, well, I didn't tell me anything. I'm like, no, I actually told you that things are good. Yeah. <laughs> so now as you're as you're pushing your training, getting ready for a triathlon, getting ready for a big event, you know, whatever it is, like, you know, in some ways, I want to see a couple of those values creeping towards sort of a yellow zone, right? Where you're pushing your boundaries yeah. without breaking it. Mm 
you know and so i think that having a, a baseline to start with it's useful information you know and it can be good um behavioral change type of motivation because there's a lot of things that people may have tested that are yeah. not with the normal range whether it's cholesterol whether you know whatever right yeah. and uh, inflammatory markers things and it might at least make them sit back and go Woo, yeah. man maybe i you know i might need to do some stuff here yeah. you know and maybe there's time for some changes and i think if you do that um it's it doesn't have to be overly complicated i just I think the thing that worries me the most is the people doing the interpreting because, you know, I think about the amount of research we do in hormones and biomarkers and things like that, and there's a lot we don't know. And I think about what my education is in this area, and there's a lot we don't know. And then I see somebody who may not even have a degree in exercise science and they, they read a forum exactly or a blog and they're like, oh, I know what all this means. And, you know, let's go get your blood work done and interpret it. You know, just... It, Lanes are funny, right? When when it's sort of like, you know, the whole stay in your lane. I actually agree with that, but the catch is those lanes are wider for some people than others because of what their area of expertise is. Mm -hmm. So I still think you have to stay within, you know, what your scope of practice is. It's just that some people technically should have a scope of practice like this, a bike lane, and then other people have a scope of practice where it's like a four-lane highway, you know, where they, they just have a lot more experience and a lot yeah. more knowledge to be able to yeah. function yeah. within that. And and so I don't have a problem with that notion of stay in your lane. It's just don't don't think that a lane is just one thing, yeah. you know. And people have these sort of different levels of of, of, of value and knowledge that that they can imply yeah. uh, and and utilize in those situations, you know. But but I do think you know how this gets used. I think is something that we have to be careful yeah. of. It's especially when people seems to typically only, I know in Australia, most of the time you won't have a client go and get testing done until they feel like there's something wrong. Right. You know, I can't sleep. I've lost my period. Yeah. You know, oh my God, go and get blood tests done. Well, actually, why don't you track that at the beginning so you have a baseline market? That's exactly it. And then in three months time, you can keep continually checking up rather than going, everything's screwed up. What do I do? Yeah. And we're fortunate with the sort of the research approach that we take. We, you know, we do blood work. In some of our preseason stuff, even this year, we finally progressed to being able to do it after two weeks into preseason because it's such an intense time. Yeah. And then every month after that, um, so roughly every 28 days. And uh, and that allows us to really start to get a picture of patterns and responses. And it's one of those things, where if you are going to work in in you know blood work and biomarkers and things like that, I think you need to pick a time frame that is short enough that you can still do something about it but not so short that it becomes overly invasive or that you get a lot of noise, right? Where you get these sort of, you know, normal fluctuations and responses, you go, oh my God, what's going on? But, you know, for us, it's, it's been, you know, I would say somewhere between three and five weeks is sort of a, 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 an ideal situation. I would absolutely recommend this for anybody who's dieting for a contest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah know so, know what's yeah. going on and get a full thyroid panel while you're doing it and see yeah. what your reverse T3 is and what's yeah. happening with this weight loss and be able to make yeah. these adjustments along the way and know ahead of time and then track yourself coming out to see what your recovery looks like and trying to optimize that environment and making sure that you're not incurring other nutritional deficiencies because of some of the things you are cutting out of your diet are you still what's happening to your iron what's happening to your omega-3s what's happening to your magnesium you like pay attention to these things you know and I think that there's a value in that absolutely and if you got guys that are you know that are on gear and stuff like that there is a value in tracking what's going on with you so that you don't go too far down the wormhole yeah. mm -hmm. before you have to try to pull yourself out yeah. you know and and that's that's a personal choice and i i don't really I, to be honest i don't care one way or the other with it it's just you know be smart about it yeah. and mm -hmm. and use this in a in a smart way to know you know how how you're responding overall yeah. supplement companies that have really good formulas um some that have got some prop formulas and you don't know what's going on right. and um yeah, they, they do a really good job at marketing. And so. Oh yeah, they're fantastic at marketing. But, <laughs> but if you look at most of the data on sort of these testosterone stimulators, um, it's very short-lived. You know, so if it does it at all, mm. if it does it at all, it's a fairly short-lived spike. And I think the other thing that we have to realize is, this is a perfect example of sort of the amateur endocrinology approach, right? Where they go, so if I, you know, we used to see this with androstene dione, right? When as a pro hormone, if you load up on androstene dione, its next step in the pathway is testosterone. So I'm getting my body to produce more testosterone. This must work, right? Because now I don't shut down my own axis. What everybody failed to notice is, A, that's a reversible reaction. And B, there's one more step in that reaction to estrone and estradiol, and those are irreversible steps. Yeah. So you can front load, the body likes homeostasis. So if I am, am, am loading something that's gonna give this heightened endogenous testosterone response, also realize the 
that you're increasing the chances of aromatization as well and conversion to estrone and estradiol. And that's not to say that the testosterone response you would get with resistance training or something is going to do that um, because again, there's, there's mitigating factors in terms of androgen receptors and stuff. But look, if I produce a 30 or 60 minute spike in testosterone, how much hypertrophy is that really going to respond to? You know, so when we're dealing with, you know, taking testosterone, right? So if you're talking anabolic steroids and stuff like that, you're changing your basal levels chronically. So in other words, it's heightened 24 hours a day. Yeah. So what happens with that is you've now changed that stimulus for protein synthesis and recovery and things like that. But to just take a pill that's going to spike it for 30 or 60 minutes is, it's going to be a drop in the bucket for the yeah. entire day. Mm -hmm. And especially if you get a homeostatic rebound where it goes up and then down before it comes back to normal. You know, is it's it a wash? Thing with um, acid. Yes. Like yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah, so that's um, that's our little slide that we did. Yeah. These are the priorities that we said based on the evidence, right? So if you 100%. sleep good, you're yep. hydrating well, and you're addressing energy balance, then you'll have a good foundation. Yep. The next thing you can do is an exercise and then look at supplementing from there. You know, it's funny, hydration is one that's often undervalued. And I know Stavros Kavoros has some really cool data on what happens with dehydration and the cortisol response, right? Because dehydration is gonna stimulate arginine vasopressin, AVP. AVP during exercise is the primary stimulus for ACTH and cortisol, not CRH. So CRH during psychological stress, corticotropic releasing hormone, or you'll see it as CRF, depending, corticotropic releasing factor, is the primary stimulus sort of at rest and with psychological stress. AVP is the prime driver during exercise, but what happens is if you're dehydrated, right, so if you're not taking enough water in the day especially, um, AVP can create a situation of heightened chronic cortisol response, right? So now your recovery is impaired as well. So hydration is an often undervalued aspect in this to sort of keep the hormones in check too. But I agree with that, sleep, energy balance, yeah, those are gonna be big drivers, right? Because during sleep, you get your growth hormone response. You get recovery from cortisol because of the normal diurnal variation and stuff like that. So sleep starts to really matter. Um, you know, there's a lot of repair that takes place here. And then the exercise driver is gonna be critical because of what it does to cause chronic manipulation and adjustments in the acute response to these hormones. And then finally, yeah, the nutrients, the supplements, the herbs. Like, it's sort of like we were talking about yesterday um, when you're looking at the protein intake and stuff is you gotta bake the cake first right people go right to the icing you know in the candles and they forget that you, you just missed the whole cake you know so do the big stuff then once you get a handle on that now you can start layering on the little stuff now that being said there are certain supplements and things that can help with all those other things so use it as a part of the strategy vitamin d exactly melatonin. yeah yeah and melatonin potential. in australia is regulated okay uh, okay yeah, yeah melatonin is interesting because there's sort of mixed data on how much it helps so there's some cool data on what it might do for jet lag but in terms of chronic effects yeah. um you know there's actually been one or two studies that have shown a testosterone down regulation with yeah, melatonin right. yeah. so we just have to be aware of that and you know again some of these are sort of smaller scale types of things um but energy balance is a critical one you know yeah. because if you're if you're in a constant state of deprivation um the body's gonna respond that way mm -hmm. and um this isn't to say we want to be in excess if you have somebody who's trying to lose body fat, we're going to need to favor that on the energy balance equation. But then it's really critical what else you're taking in to preserve the rest of the functions and things like that. And getting enough sleep because then the sleep's going to help with that as well. Yeah, perfect. Awesome. I think we'll leave it there. Cool. We'll get going. We're good. You're going for a surf. Probably. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. the plan. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Absolutely, guys. My Thanks. pleasure. It's a funny like.